Good evening. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And I have to say, it's a real honor to be here with all of you this evening and in this beautiful theater. And I'm just hoping everyone will take a moment to look around and look up at this wonderful cultural space we're in. <clears throat> I'm so honored to take part in this event to help celebrate the wonderful graduates of the program in International and Comparative Studies here at the University of Michigan. And I have to say, I was thinking on the drive to Ann Arbor today, the world really has never needed a new generation of global thinkers as much as it does today. So it's especially meaningful to be here as part of your graduation ceremony. Some of you today may be marking the holy month of Ramadan, and I just remembered I could take this off, sorry. Uh, and you may be waiting to break your fasts, and to you I would say, as they do in my father's home country of Algeria, Sahaf Turkum, uh, which literally means, uh, may you break your fast in good health. And I know that many others have celebrated other uh, sacred days recently, and I hope that those were nourishing celebrations. I think there's nothing more wonderful than the convergence of different holidays and diverse traditions. <clears throat> Tonight, I'm going to offer the graduates a little entirely unsolicited advice about their future work based on my own experiences working globally. And most of all, I want to make the case for what I'm going to call vigilant optimism in 2022 as a core part of transnational work and vision. However, before I do that, I wanted to start out this evening's remarks with a joke, particularly one from the field of international work, as it has been a long and serious year with too many reasons to grieve. So I think we all truly need to laugh. And in any case, that is what graduation speakers are supposed to do. I began thinking about how to start a speech with a joke in another very non-funny time, which was back in 2004, shortly after the Iraq War. I had to speak to a banquet audience that included one of my idols, the former Irish President Mary Robinson, who had just finished her term as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Needless to say, I was very nervous. Shortly before that speech, I attended a meeting of the International Council on Human Rights Policy in Geneva. And after dinner one evening, I found myself walking with three Indian human rights activists, two professors of human rights law, one Welsh and one Scottish, and a Peruvian indigenous rights activist. And I realized that this itself begins to sound like the setup of a joke. And actually, we did walk into a bar eventually, making it sound even more like a setup, but it's not. I told this transnational group of brilliant human rights proponents that I was speaking at the dinner before President Robinson and asked them to tell me any international human rights jokes they might know that I could tell before her. For the first time since I had met this loquacious group, they all fell completely silent. We walked along for several minutes, and finally one of the Indian human rights advocates looked at me quite seriously and exclaimed, Karima, I am fairly certain there are no human rights jokes. <laughs> All the others, the other two Indian activists, the Welsh and Scottish academics, and even the ebullient Peruvian indigenous rights advocate all agreed. When I started to prepare the speech the following week, I decided to try to confirm this. It just didn't seem possible. Were there really no international human rights jokes? So I scoured the internet. And I have to say, I couldn't find any. So I tried international law jokes. Uh, that's my broader field. And what I found was first an article by a former UN weapons inspector, Scott Ritter, entitled, The Search for Iraqi WMD Has Become a Public Joke. That's about as close as we could find to an international law joke. I then found a New York Inquirer piece about the ill-fated attempts by the then UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, to tell jokes in public, something which should have been a warning to me. And I also sadly located a reference to the arrests of Burmese comics by the junta in 2000. Clearly some things have not changed. But I turned up no actual human rights jokes. And as I found in the last few days while writing this speech, and again going back to my search for human rights humor, this still remains true. In fact, the very titles of those items that I did find back in 2004 suggest why there is such a dearth of jokes in the field. There is often little that anyone feels it appropriate to joke about. 
But who could need humor more than human rights defenders or those who are setting off on global careers in 2022? So I think one useful thing the next generation of global graduates we honor tonight can do going forward is to create a repository for international humor. And I regret to say that without such a resource available so far, I have no joke to begin with this evening. <laughs> In all seriousness, tonight we come together in all our diversities to celebrate the University of Michigan's International and Comparative Studies graduates. You are the class of 2022, the class that could, to paraphrase the children's book. You have weathered a global pandemic and multiple crises at home and around the world, and you are still standing. Looking at your bios on the program's website was inspiring. You come from across the state, around the country, and many different corners of the world, from Escanaba to Changsha, China, from Grand Rapids to New Delhi, India. You are interested in a wide array of languages, regions, and topics, from women in foreign policy to environmental issues. Indeed, it is a sincere privilege to teach this year at a university where so many students are engaging in global studies. The program in international and comparative studies of which you have been an integral part is a vital focal point for the interdisciplinary study of issues that transcend borders. Nothing could be more relevant today. So let me say how very proud I am, how very proud we all are of you and your work and your global outlook. You give us hope for the future of our world, which is a great gift in these times. I not only congratulate you, but also your professors, your families, your partners, and parents, and children, and friends, and everyone who has contributed to what you have achieved. And at the same time, as we look back and honor your time here at the University of Michigan, we also look forward to your future endeavors, as many of you are just now setting out on a longer journey of global and international study and work. Your time in a formal university is done, at least for now, and you are now enrolling in the University of the World. Be open to it as it too can teach you so many critical lessons I have found. Studying, working, and living globally across borders can contribute to realizing the words of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which in its opening stanza reminds us that, quote, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, unquote. The human family. Think what it would mean to reconceptualize our world that way, to organize it that way. As our warming planet faces a shared climate emergency and a shared pandemic, as we live in the shadow of conflicts and nuclear weapons, our societies and our world need a new global generation committed to realizing that vision of the Universal Declaration, and we need you urgently. The biggest problems we face will stop at no one's borders. So our partners, our analysis, our solutions must not either. We must work together to find transnational solutions to inherently transnational problems in all our interests for all the members of that great human family. My theme for this evening is, as I said, global optimism. More than anything, I think we need today a vigilant optimism appropriate to our times, which recognizes the gravity of the global challenges before us, but refuses to bow to them. We have many struggles to wage in the pandemic, but one of the most important is to hold on to hope and our belief in the ability to change things for the better. That is my first wish for you all as you graduate. An Afghan woman human rights defender I interviewed in Kabul back in 2010 when she was in a terrible security situation told me something that has stayed with me. She said, optimism is key to survival. It is a message many young Afghan women have taken to heart despite the turbulent era their nation has faced. 
I am moved to remember that just one year ago, on April 11, 2021, despite the terrible situation even then in Afghanistan, with increasing concerns about the possible return to power of the Taliban, a fear which has now materialized. Two young Afghan women, Tamana Jahan and Nazima Kherzad, became the first women to climb Shah Foladi, a peak in Bamiyan that is more than 5,000 meters high. They did so after two previous failed attempts. As Tamana Jahan explained, we knew there were challenges and dangers, but these challenges and dangers made us more determined to conquer this peak. That is the spirit we need to face up to the pandemic and the post-pandemic, to climb the peaks before us, and many of you have already showed it in the last years. Such determination is found around the world, across the age spectrum. I think, for example, of the 76-year-old Russian artist, Elena Osipova, who has been painting against the invasion of Ukraine and has been arrested repeatedly in St. Petersburg, carrying her paintings in public at anti-war demonstrations. The bad news in our world makes the headlines, but I have seen people globally working together in hope in ways that have made such an important difference and we have to make sure that their stories are more well known. People have often said to me, even in my own family, that as a human rights lawyer now for many years, this must have given me a pessimistic view of humanity. And in fact, what I've found is that I have also seen the best of people everywhere. I think of the Pakistani environmental advocates bringing public interest cases to improve their nation's climate policies, or the Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot cultural heritage defenders I met working together to restore the heritage of everyone on their island, or the Malaysian activists seeking to keep alive the Wayang Kulit shadow puppetry despite extremist bans on it in a particular province, or the US civil rights lawyers challenging police misconduct long before the issue made global headlines. In my experience, it often turns out that doing the right thing is also strategically the best option. And I want to tell a story that illustrates this. I brought an Iraqi priest named Father Najib Michael to speak at the UN about his experiences trying to protect some of the oldest Christian manuscripts in the world during the armed conflict in Iraq. Uh, and this was the, in particular the conflict uh, with the so-called Islamic State. He fled his home city of Erbil with many of these ancient manuscripts packed in a van, fleeing just ahead of the extremist fighters. As he was driving, he passed a group of refugees, people of diverse religions, who were trying to flee desperately on foot. The priest debated what he should do. His mission was to save history itself, the ancient manuscripts, but he realized that his conscience would not allow him to leave these desperate people behind. So he made room for them in the van, along with the manuscripts, trying to protect them all. When he reached the border where he could cross into safety, he was told that for security reasons, he could not take his vehicle. What was he going to do with the manuscripts? Well, he had made a choice. So everyone got out of the van and took the manuscripts with them, and he and the refugees together carried them across the border, and afterwards, men, women, and children returned each and every one to him, and he never would have been able to carry them by himself. When faced with challenging decisions in my global work, I often think of Father Najib's brilliant choice, and I hope that you will too. As you set out on your next journey, I thought I might take a few moments with your indulgence to give advice. This is, with age, it becomes fun to give advice. Uh, and I'm here sort of emulating the king's counselor, Polonius, uh, who was giving advice to his departing son, Laertes, you may remember, in Act I of Hamlet, along the lines of, to thine own self be true. And I have to say, I inherited a love of Shakespeare from my Algerian father. 
But I remember that Shakespeare being Shakespeare, Polonius actually comes across as slightly ridiculous in the play, and things don't actually work out so well for Laertes, despite all the advice uh, due to a certain Danish prince. So I'm going to try to approach this task with a certain amount of humility. And I can honestly say that unlike Polonius, I recognize that your global journey may be nothing like mine, and even it may be nothing like what you expect, and that you will find your own lessons along the way. However, these are things I wish someone had told me as I graduated from law school and the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies here at the University of Michigan long, long ago, and set off to be an international human rights lawyer. I've listed six lessons, but I don't think I'm gonna get through them all, let's see. The first lesson, work hard. Nothing can be achieved without that. And work to the highest standard, but don't work too hard. I remember colleagues at Amnesty International who were famous for working in the office until 2 a.m. nearly every night. Try to find a committed and healthy way to do global and international work so you can enjoy your life and sustain your commitment. Second, remember that the principles of global justice that some of you will be working for should apply not only to the substance of your work, but to how you treat those you work with and those who have to live with you while you do this work. As Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. Three, think locally, nationally, and globally. We truly live in an interconnected world, and it is so important to see how what is happening around the world is tied to what is happening right in front of you, and vice versa. Four, even while you are thinking of trying to address the big picture, always remember that you can only contribute a modest piece to resolving much broader global issues. This makes the work more humanly manageable. As my students know, I love to cite a character uh, who was a Chinese-Australian journalist named Billy Kwan, played brilliantly by the actor Linda Hunt in a film called The Year of Living Dangerously. Faced with terrible poverty and repression in 1965 Indonesia, Kwan tries to find a way to respond, not just as a photographer, but as a human being. He decides to help one family. As he says, you add your light to the sum of light. Remember that even the late great Nelson Mandela did not end apartheid by himself. He was part of a huge national and international movement that did. Five, recognize your victories even when they may be hard to recognize, even when they may be small. For example, in the field of international human rights law, sometimes you take cases knowing you will lose. Sometimes that is all you can do, and sometimes even that can be very meaningful to victims and survivors. Finally, just because victories may be small, don't lower your expectations. To quote the song from Man of La Mancha, my father's favorite musical, do not stop dreaming the impossible dreams or trying to right the unrightable wrongs. I think about how much change there has been for the better on so many issues in my lifetime, on the recognition of women's rights or racial injustice, just to give a few examples. I think of the first international case before the UN Human Rights Committee that led to the recognition that discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation was prohibited by international law. This case is called Tunin versus Australia. In that case, gay rights advocates in Tasmania sought to challenge a piece of anti-gay legislation specifically as a violation of human rights before the UN Human Rights Committee. They asked an Australian judge for advice should they bring the case, and he told them not to, thinking there was no way the UN Human Rights Committee was ready for it back in 1994. And as he courageously says now, he is so glad they didn't listen to him because Mr. Tunin won, and then the case was cited by the high courts of many countries, and the law was struck down in Tasmania. And this became part of the bedrock of the relevant body of international human rights law being built on every single day to protect people from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. It was, as the former High Commissioner for Human Rights said, a watershed with wide-ranging implications, and it might never have happened at all if the pessimistic advice had been followed. 
however important it is to factor in the constraints of pragmatism and the doable. Do not be afraid to think globally, to think big, to think creatively, and to keep asking the large questions in front of us. Always remember the words of the great Irish playwright, Oscar Wilde, who wrote that a map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. And when humanity lands there, it looks out and seeing a better country sets sail. Progress, Wilde said, is the realization of utopias. Well, that is enough lessons from one day from me, Polonius, or Oscar Wilde. So let me end by saluting you again for your global work and commitments in these difficult times and saying how excited I am to see what you will achieve, what watershed international advances you will bring us with real meaning for real people nearby and far away. Most of all, as you set out on the road forward from the University of Michigan to the University of the World, I have a second and final hope for you. May you flourish. Thank you very much.